I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my awesome chair of wisdom and answer all your awesome questions about the First World War. Calvin Loafing writes, I was reading about Enzo Ferrari, the founder of the namesake sports car company. And I read that he served in the war with the Italian 3rd Mountain Artillery Regiment. I looked into the aforementioned regiment and couldn't find much information in English other than that they distinguished themselves in the World Wars, plural. If the team or anyone out there has any more information, it would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for a wonderful show. I'm on my fifth watch through. Fifth watch through? Wow. That's more than me. Okay. Well done. Uh, let's see. Um, Enzo Ferrari did indeed serve in the 3rd Mountain Artillery Regiment, uh, as the Great War forced him to leave school since he was 17. Sadly, not a lot is known of his active service career. We know that his regiment was assigned to an Alpini group, and that Enzo showed a keen interest in metalworking, which probably prompted him to apply for work as a welder right after the war. Um, his brother and his father died during the war, and Enzo nearly himself died of the flu in 1918. But uh, I, honestly, I, I can't give you a more detailed answer to his service. However, the history of Ferrari as a company kind of began during the war. Um, Francesco Baracca, Italy's most decorated flying ace, had been with the cavalry before he became a pilot. And in 1916, after his first downed Austrian plane, he painted a prancing black stallion on the side of his Newport 11. This gave him the nickname Cavalier of the Skies. Baraka would become quite the legend during the war with 34 aerial victories. And in his honor, Enzo chose to use the Black Stallion, the Cavalino Rampante, for the logo of his automobiles. He just added the yellow background as an homage to his hometown of Modena. So Ferrari's roots are in the Great War. So they should totally sponsor us, by the way, right? So whoever's out there watching from Ferrari, you know, get a hold of Flo and, you know, give us some money for a sponsorship. Okay, cool. Uh, ben Dover, really? Benjamin Dover, shall we? I'm not going to dignify him by, by calling him by his brief name. Benjamin Dover asks, Hello, Indy and team. There is contemporary footage of tanks in some of your videos on tanks that feature sound. But I thought most footage of the time lacked sound. When did wartime footage first get accompanying sound? Is the sound in these clips authentic? No, they are not authentic. The sound you hear in our videos on those clips is done by the studio magic of our audio engineer, Mark. The historical footage is silent as it was not possible to capture sound on film during the Great War. When I say not possible though, I mean there were theories and prototypes on how to capture sound on the same track as film, but nothing more practical. You could say the Great War kind of interrupted progress that was moving in that direction. Leon Gaumont had theorized about sound on disc systems. Um, Edison built the kinetophone, which was based on cylinders to sync the sound. And Eugene Laust uh, patented the first sound on film concept of capturing the sound via microphones on a separate track on the film. Right? Most of these projects were multinational efforts though, like British and French or French-German film associations. And of course the war broke down those connections and definitely relocated their funding. Um, these efforts were started again right after the war, mostly by the Americans. See, the American army had placed a huge emphasis on capturing the war in Europe on film to bring it back and show it to the people at home. If you'd like to hear the sound of actual tanks, we did film at the Tank Museum in Bovington, and here you go. Okay. Uh, hi, Indy. I was wondering about why is the American Expeditionary Force being paired up with the French and not British units? You would think common language would be a great asset. Was it because of some lingering animosities from the British-American wars? No. 
There was no lingering animosity between Britain and its former colonies, the U.S., at this point anymore. There were tensions because of the war, for sure, uh, especially because of the huge amount of credit the U.S. provided the Allies. But overall, most of the American public had decided eventually to support the Entente. Nonetheless, Pershing and his staff symbolically went to the grave of the Marquis de Lafayette and Charles Stanton and emphasized the French-American friendship with the words, And here and now, in the presence of the illustrious dead, we pledge our hearts and our honor in carrying this war to a successful issue. Lafayette, we are here. It was a gesture thanking the French for their assistance during their own war for independence, and them now returning the favor in assisting the French forces. But more important than those gestures was the state of the French army, kinda, you know? Since the failure of the Nivelle offensives, morale and manpower had been really low, and reinforcements were in dire need. By this time, the French had a focused war economy, though. Lots of guns and ammunition to spare, but not the manpower to really take advantage of that. The Americans had men, but not the equipment, and that is a perfect match. It's, it's tough to say how stricken the French army actually was at that point. It depends a little on which historian you want to rely on. The more pessimistic ones don't give much hope that the French would have been much longer in the fight if the Americans had not arrived in force to reignite the belief in victory, and if the German spring offensives had been a little more effective. Some disagree, right? Uh, the situation was, yeah, sure, it was dire. I, that much you can see in the desperate behavior of, of, of Ferdinand Foch to get Americans as quickly as possible into the line. The British, on the other hand, were still fairly well off. Their morale and manpower was unshaken despite the losses, and they could carry themselves okay with the help from their dominions. France had already depleted much of its manpower pool in that regard. If you'd like to see a whole episode we did about the evolution of the French infantry, which covers all of this, you can click right here for that. And you can also check out our subreddit, which has all kinds of cool World War I stuff. See you next time.